Hi everyone, Dennis Foley from Acoustic Fields. Today we're going to continue our series of Don't Do This. I think this is number eight in the series. And what this series is all about is the photographs that you send in uh, showing your room setup on our room form. I pull from the, those room forms photos and I'll tell you when we have our conversation over the phone what not to do. And then I think it's good information for others who are going through the same thing. So in this first graphic, we see the speakers directly against the, the wall. Now, granted, it's a very small room, but putting speakers close to the wall, and this is a professional system setup, will create, you know, two, three, four dB of extra energy at certain frequencies. Why do we need that? We don't. So we want to be very, very careful with our setup. So. And then we've got a big screen between the speakers, which is problematic, but that's the way it goes today in uh, these mixing environments, uh, especially ones that don't go to the studios anymore and are setting up their, their rooms at home. And I understand it, but the screen we can live with. The speakers against the wall, we can't because they both produce audible distortions. But that plus two, plus three, plus four dB push or bump from speaker boundary interference effect we just can't have, especially in a professional room like this where you're mixing. Okay, now let's look at another photo. In this photo, you can see, and, and this was a real uh, kind of a touching scenario for, for us to try and figure out because the client really wanted help because he realized that he wasn't getting anywhere near the quality of sound out of his system that he could. And then when you take a look at this picture, we have a huge glass window on the left channel we have a big screen, almost equal to the size of the window, between the speakers on the front wall. So right away, and then the picture doesn't show it, but on the right channel, there's no wall. So we have this huge window on the left channel, primary, secondary, and tertiary reflection points. Then we have a screen on the center wall, and then we have an open right boundary surface area. So we have three strikes going against us. Now, that in and of itself is horrible, but what also is horrible is we have no place in the room to treat. So, unfortunately, I had to tell the client, that, you know, we can't help with this room. We don't have any place to treat, and the places that we do have to treat acoustically, we can't. So, <laughs> we're kind of between a rock and a hard place in, in situations like this. And this is why these living, listening room combinations are really difficult and we don't do too many of them anymore because the acoustical requirements that you have to put in the room to get the system to sound good, there's just simply not space. If there is space, uh, the visual aspect of the treatment is not appealing to some members of the household. So that's what we got there. In this photo, you can see we have a setup here where <laughs> We have a, a screen in the corner and it's off the right channel. So it directly impacts the reflections that we get off the right channel. Now let's become a sound wave for a minute. Let's become a middle and high frequency. So we see that screen and it's at a certain angle. So when we strike that screen, we don't have a steering wheel as a frequency. We can't control the direction. Angle of incidence equals angle of refraction. So whatever angle we strike that screen at, that's the angle that's gonna come back at the listening position. And if you can see the chair there, that's the listening position. So really we're redirecting all this reflected energy, not from both channels, which would be bad in and of itself, but it's even worse when we're only doing it to one channel. I always tell people, if you're gonna make mistakes, make them on both channels because at least then we have some continuity. Even though it's wrong, we we're, we're at least have some continuity and, and balance. So in this situation, we have a screen in the corner and all the middle and high frequency reflections are bouncing off of that. And worse yet, the angle is such that they're coming back at the mixed position or at the listening position. So not good for a lot of reasons. Also, it's a hard surface and we all know uh, what that entails when it comes to middle and high frequency absorption. In this video, you can see that we have a fireplace right between the two channels. Okay. We all know from my past videos that fireplaces are resonating chambers, right? They produce sound. What sound and what frequency depends on 
just like a room. The width, the length, and the height. That firebox, that fireplace is a small room. And it's going to exhibit acoustical properties of those dimensions of that fireplace. So what is it? Three foot by three foot, maybe two feet deep. So if we run the numbers on that, you're going to get problems, you know, in the 600, 800, thousand cycle range, maybe even a little bit lower. So why would we want that right between our speakers? Remember, the distance between our speakers is sacred ground. We don't want anything interfering with that. In a world, a best case scenario, we want acoustical treatment. We, we want absorption and diffusion. But in this case, we have a fireplace with a hole. So it becomes a resonating chamber with the dimensions of the firebox. And that's a no-no. Easy to fix. We do it all the time. We design diaphragmatic absorbers that sit in the firebox. Obviously, you don't want to turn the fireplace on when it's in there. So most of the fireplaces we do, they're not used. And it, and I would say about 80% of the clients I talk to don't use their fireplaces. So question whether you even need them in a house or not. Think about it, you know, if you're building a new house. That's pretty strong data, and I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't think I've ever come across a situation where the fireplace actually works or they use it. So give that some thought on a new construction situation, especially if it's going to be in an audio room. All right, the next one we have here you can see a similar situation. We have an alcove in the room, okay? It's a little indented place within the room. I call it an alcove. Maybe that's not the correct term. But that has a resonant frequency also, based on what? The width, the height, and the depth. Looks to be about two feet in, in depth, maybe 10 feet wide, six, eight feet high, something along those dimensions. And the client has chosen to put all his gear in that little space. Well, that's a big problem. One, for left and right channel reflections. Two, just like we went over with the fireplace, we're going to be fighting resident frequencies of that alcove. Okay, how do we fix it? Well, we just simply fill the alcove in with the proper treatment. Our ACDA units would sit perfectly in there and form a wall and take away all the resonances. And then you'd have a nice wall uh, that's even with the other walls in the room and you can get uh, proper acoustic design and treatment that way. So. Five things on what not to do for this video, and we'll continue on uh, with this process through the series. Hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video, and if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. We also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to, so please do that because we offer special price discounts to only those on our newsletter. And then don't forget about our forum. We have started a forum on our own website where people ask questions and I usually get a chance every couple days to look at it. There's an interchange between people on the forum and we'll give you real answers uh, on a regular basis so that'll help you. Thank you.